Hello, this is Jared French of the Faith Family Bartonville Baptist Church coming to you to open God's Word. We are in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew, this chapter paints a vibrant picture. It does so because it paints with the blood. And it's, a, it's actually a vibrant picture of the many ways that people respond to Jesus. And uh, many, there are many things they get right when they respond to him, and yet they can still miss some of the major things. And so with the theme of Thanksgiving, the season of Thanksgiving, this text can really help us pause and consider how we should be thankful and humbled by the fact that we can know him and grow to know him, and not just to be uh, stop and growing to know him. Uh, and that's where the humility comes in, that we don't have everything put together, even m myself, as I need to grow and and may know a lot, but then put uh, have it applied to my heart more and more. And so, with that introduction, that's Matthew chapter 27. I will read a portion of it, uh, 1 through 56. So if you have a copy of God's Word, if you'd follow along with me, this is the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When daybreak came, all the chief priests and the elders, the people that plotted against Jesus to put him to death, after tying him up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing what has, had, Jesus had been condemned, was full of remorse and re returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us, they said. See to it yourself. And so he threw the silver into the temple and departed. Then he went and hanged himself. All right, there's more there, but I want to move down to verse 15. At the festival, the governor's custom was release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, there was a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who is it you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Now, the Sanhedrin already had prepared the, crowd, the, the crowds and to ask for Barabbas and to ask G, for Jesus, the, the ones called Christ, to be crucified. In verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was not getting, he was, he, he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water. He washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. And all the people answered him, His blood be on us and our children. The next verses talk about how Jesus was flogged. He was led to Gal Galgotha, the place of the skulls, and crucified between two criminals. And as that was going on, go to verse 45. Verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima Shabbatathani, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And the people discussed that among themselves and the verses and, and then verse 50. But Jesus then cried out again with a loud voice and then gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain in the temple sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks split open, the tombs were also open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection and entered the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and these, the things that had happened, they were terrified. And said, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the reading of God's word, what we just read. What we just read about five responses to the shedding of Jesus' blood. And that's what we're going to walk through. Because these five responses are still happening today. And so first we'll look at Judas' response in verses 10, 1 through 10. Second, we'll look at Pilate in verses 11 through 24. Then we'll look at the people in verses 25 through 26. And then uh, the next two we'll look in one point. Verse point four will be the earth and the nations, how they respond in verses 45 through 56. And the fifth point is a kind of a bonus response. Have us meditate upon how, how we're responding to Jesus. 
So five points, we'll walk through this text and uh, read it into our lives. So at this point, I like to stop and pray. If you would, pr uh, pause with me. Blessing Father, I acknowledge you as the God, the creator of all, sustainer of life, the one who defines life. And so our lives, while there's many things that can make them up, that we can think about, if we put on a list, what's my life entail? But man does not live by those things. Everything that we put on a list, we live by the word of God. You are what uh, give us things that, that, that are in our hands and the things that pass through our hands. You give and you take away with purposes to, to actually show us how much you have a plan, how you are purposeful, and how you are loving. Sometimes we don't always see that and understand that, but sometimes that starts with how we are responding to Jesus in the first place and what we have from Jesus and how thankful we are for Jesus. And so that's what we have an opportunity to look at this text, to uh, examine our hearts, examine how we need to respond to other people, not just to judge them, but to, to see, see where they're at and see where, what, they need to, what hurdles they need to cross to behold more Jesus, to behold Jesus for the first time. Behold as in trust in him, trust in that he's been risen, from the dead, that he conquered sin, and that he shows us the love of God. And so, God, I pray for this time in your word. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So, the, we're following the blood in the first part of what's Matthew chapter 27, and there's these state, blood statements, and they, they reveal people's hearts. And so we start with the bad guy, uh, the bad guy, the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, in verses 1 through 10. And uh, Judas is easy to hate. I mean, it's easy to kind of put him on a class of all his own. And, and, and so, right, because he's a betrayer. No one likes a betrayer. And there's also this mysterious element around him. When, when you read Luke 22, verse 3, or John 13, verse 27, they give the, a different vantage point, or more of a vantage point, where, where Satan enters into Judas at that last supper. And so that, again, kind of sets Judas apart in our mind because we think, well, how does that happen? And, and we think, well, that never happened with me. And so verses 1 through 10, we don't really connect that deeply with that often. But you know what? Really what happened there, what, what, what uh, Luke and, and John bring out, that Matthew decides that, that's, that he can just leave it in the backdrop, is that... Judas, what, what, what was going on with him and Satan is not mysterious, per se. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 calls Satan the prince, or the, the power of the prince of the air. Okay, the prince of the air. So Satan entering our following is, is as natural as us breathing. Ouch. Now, we can't, that doesn't mean we can go blame Satan for everything that's wrong. Uh, dealing with that would take a, a different sermon. But my point here is, is to take Judas Iscariot <coughs> and, he, and say he's not unique in, in how he responds to Jesus. He's really not. He's actually representative of something that's more standard, more normal of the world around us. And so we look at Judas. We, we see how he, he sees. He sees how he participated in the schemes of man and the schemes of the devil. His eyes are open to that much of it. He says you know, he's participated in the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Verse 4, he says he, he rightly sees that he sinned and that Jesus was innocent of all the things that they brought, charges that were brought against him in that trial at night. But then Judas wants to get out from underneath that blood. He wants to get out from underneath. And so he tries to return that money, that 30 pieces of silver, the 30 pieces of silver that, that were, was pre-agreed pre upon between him and the Jewish council called the Sanhedrin, made up the, of the rulers, uh, and he and uh, he wants to give the money back to kind of clear his conscience. And uh, the, the the Sanhedrin, those chief priests who paid him the silver, they said, "No, we can't take that back. We can't take that back into the temple and put it in the treasury. That's blood money now." Now they end up finding use for it, and that's what verses seven to ten deal with. And in fact, it actually fulfills prophecy on how they uh, uh, prophecy of Jeremiah chapter thirty-two on, on how they create a a um, field a burial for. Judas. 
Now, but however, since Judas failed to get out from beneath the blood by his own effort, his soul gives away to guilt or sorrow that leads to death. 2 Corinthians 7.10 talks about that, a, a sorrow that leads to death. And truly, we see that with Judas, don't we? But you see, what Judas, what he was doing, he was focusing on what he did. He focused on what other people did. He maybe, maybe thought about what the devil did. Yet, if he remembered the past three years about what Jesus did and what Jesus said in those past three years, Judas's response to this shedding of innocent blood could have been so much different. Could have been. If you remember Jesus' word, that, that how the, this difficult, sorrowful of circumstances was in God's hands, it can become life-giving. It can be a godly sorrow that leads to turning and salvation. Also, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Now, to keep this kind of short, because we have more points, uh, Judas is not a one-off character. He's actually quite normal. Judas reflects how many people live and respond to Jesus. There are many who are crushed under guilt, focusing on what we do as individuals, what other people have done, to them or with the devil, but yet they're not ever hearing or seeing what Jesus is doing. But they're crushed. And so he's kind of normal of people around us. So now let's move to point two. <coughs> so we're following the blood, the responses to the shedding of Jesus' blood, and we move into verses 11 through 24. And where do we see the next statement about blood? Well, it's with another bad guy. The Roman governor, or the proper title for him, he's a perfect. Uh, that's the title, perfect. And so it's Pontius Pilate. Pilate enters the picture because he has the keys to the death penalty. He is Rome's man. When Rome conquered nations, right, they conquered these nations, different uh, people groups, and uh, they gave them some self-rule, but they, they always limited and restricted certain rights. And and. The death penalty was one of those. So the Jewish authorities could condemn Jesus to die, but then they would need the Roman uh, representative to um, bring that up. Uh, Pilate to actually rubber stamp that execution sentence and carry it out. And Pilate is not a nice guy. Now there's a first century Roman Jewish historian named Josephus. Josephus writes about Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, uh, not just from Josephus, we could probably get from multiple sources, but he served as governor there in the Jerusalem, Israel area from 26 to 36. So 10 years. And those 10 years were marked by hatred of Jews. He stole money from the Jerusalem temple to, for building projects. He painted Jerusalem with signs and idols of Rome. He, he put up equivalents of flags, uh, uh, he put coins with the, the, their objects of worship. He, he put up shields with the face of Caesar. And all those things, as he was doing that, caused riots. And, and he was quite efficient at resolving riots through taking care of business, taking care of the people who were rioting. In fact, this man was removed in year 36 because he just got done killing a bunch of Samaritans which is another group who are kind of cousins to the Jews. It was to the point that the Romans, as bloody as they are, uh, as you look at history, they were shocked about how much this man shed blood. And so, like, we need to rec recall him. You see, Pontius Pilate had a legion at his disposal, a thousand men. And that's on a, that's on a normal day. And he knew how to use them. And so for the first readers of Matthew, as they were hearing of this account, they would understand the, the power of a, a governor, a perfect of Rome. And uh, they probably still knew stories about Pilate's bloody hands, about all the number of innocent people that Pilate killed. And so it's probably more shocking for the, 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 those first hearers and readers is, is that Pilate is unsettled before Jesus. He's not acting normal. He's kind of off his game. And so that, that's probably what's shocking. And yet Pilate right, ends up walking in a similar path as Judas. He's trying to get out from beneath the blood. The first attempt is he uses a tradition. This is a holiday. This is a Passover season. And so he, he wants to release a prisoner for them. And then they have a choice. They can have Judas, Jesus, Barabbas, 
which Brabus, Brabus means son of Abba, son of father. And I said, Jesus, you heard me right. You probably see in a footnote in your Bible that there, there is manuscript evidence that his first name is Jesus. So you can have that Jesus or you can have Jesus that is called Christ. So you really have a choice. Which Jesus do you want? And they choose Barabbas, who is a zealot, a, a rebel against Rome with the sword. So Pilate really failed. His, his attempt to get Jesus, who's called the Christ, released, failed. And so the second attempt is he found a better way than Judas for his guilt. To cleanse his conscience, he washed his hands. And then he puts the blame on everyone else. Verse 24, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. So he washes his hand and he kind of still rubber stamps the execution. Because his soldiers are the ones that have to pull it off. And, uh, but ultimately he thinks, I'm out for me that, that bloody flow. Now to keep it short, Pilate is a bloody governor. But he reflects many in this world. As much as we kind of want to put him as a one-off, he, he's like many who see Jesus and they, there's something in them that starts to trigger like, oh, I should respond differently to Jesus. But then come up short. Many people like Jesus. May, like, like things about him, but, but then they do not like the idea that, that Jesus sheds his blood for them. So instead of considering Je Jesus' purpose, Pilate just leaves Jesus to other people to figure out. Washes his hand, but he also just leaves it, just like many others of this world. They just go back to normal. And so Pilate returns to his bloody ways until he's removed by Rome. So that's Pilate. That's point three. Or that's point two. We're moved to point three now. And uh, right, we're, we're looking at the responses to the shedding of Jesus' blood. The death sentence is hanging over Jesus it's only a matter of time before he's going to be heading to the place of execution, Golgotha, the place of skulls, to be crucified on a cross between two criminals. And these criminals were probably guilty of crimes like Barabbas. And uh, the power that seems to be driving Jesus to the cross are the people, the crowd, the shouting. I mean, and, but there's two ironies here in the fact that the people are responding to Jesus in this way. Two ironies. First, uh, is, is they, how they respond to their choice of Jesus. And, right, they, they, they want to choose the one they think they want. They think they want Jesus Barabbas, whose na full name, if you unpack Jesus and Barabbas, means God saves son of the father. Ooh, that's close enough. <laughs> well, that, 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 that name is right, close enough, and, and he kind of resembles us. We'll keep him. And so verse 26, they do get, they get him. Now that Jesus disappears. Maybe he ends up being killed by Roman soldiers later that week because he just returns to his old ways. Or maybe he ends up following Jesus Christ because he sees how strange it was for him to be released. And this innocent man went to the cross. There's something different about him. And then he ends up getting killed because he's following Jesus. He's lost the pa to the page of history. But ultimately, my point here is we're looking at the people, okay? And, and they, they want a Jesus of their own creation, a Jesus that they can control, which kind of sounds familiar. Now, before I unpack that any longer, the second irony is that they respond to Jesus' blood in the right manner. They don't try to get out from underneath it, unlike the other two that we've looked at. They say in verse 25, His blood on us and our children. His blood on us. As they're, they're saying that in the Passover season, when, they, when there's a lamb's blood that's going to be put above them. They're saying a lot more than what they, they, they understand in that, that sentence. That the, the blood of the Messiah, God sent one, was supposed to be over the people of Israel. Now, to keep this short on the crowd's response, they think they're driving it. They think they're getting their way. They think they have the power. They think they can have Jesus their way. And those are all things they're going to end up stumbling over, and they're going to have to see that's actually wrong if they're going to truly be underneath that flow of God's Passover lamb, final Passover lamb that he and his son, Jesus Christ. Because they have the right response, but their hearts are still far from God. Okay, now um, let's move to point four. Point four. And, and we're following these statements on the blood. 
And verses 27 through 44 kind of summarize that. The soldiers are mock and beat Jesus in preparation to, for him to be crucified, as if he needed to be prepared for that. He then carries the cross, and you get the Simon, uh, helps, a, a different Simon helps him carry it. And he's crucified between those two criminals. There's the mocking at the, uh, of those at the feet of the cross, and they put that sign above. Jesus says that he's king of Israel. There's many important details there. Uh, details on how uh, it's been kind of long what we've been talking about how often people can get things right about Jesus but still end up being really wrong about him so they keep getting right that he is king and yet look how they are responding to him mocking now where we're heading into we're meant to contrast verses 1 through 44 to what happens next in verses 45 through 56 these two more responses to Jesus' blood Two responses here in this point. Now I'm going to draw our attention to how the earth, creation, responds to Jesus' blood. That's the fourth response. And verse 50, let me remind you. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the temple, uh, the curtain of the sanctuary temple tore in two from top to bottom. The earthquake and the rocks were split. Now I interpret this meaning that the ground Creation has been underneath Jesus' blood for a while here. as It has been escalating. When, he, when Jesus was flogged, when the thorns, the crown of thorns were put in, into his skull, when the nails were put into his hands and feet to hang him to that cross, as he hung there, right, drip, drip by drip, by drip, drip by drip, until when Jesus gave up his spirit to death, that last blood dropped. And then the earth trembled. Because the king of Israel, the king of all creation, bled for us. Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with layer paints until now. Right? Sin and death has been felt by creation, by the earth, and since Genesis 3. The world trembles at the sight, both in horror that the death of the king, and then in anticipation of what this means. The restoration, the removal, the curse. And so that's why there's this shaking, shaking so much that the temple, there's this temp, the curtain that, that represents this division between God and man. It's torn. You see the ground giving up the dead. This is the earth kind of responding, trembling, and, and they're actually moving in a place of worship. They're anticipating that, that all this bloodshedding means something more. It means something very important that God has promised since the very beginning. That these curses would be reversed. Now, this might sound a little strange to you, that the, the earth is responding. The text does not say that explicitly. But you see, there's a biblical theme that, that, that God uses in, inanimate objects or animals to shame human beings. So the waves, the sky, the sun, animals respond to God. And that runs all the way through the Old Testament, New Testament. So much so that then you see with Jesus, he calms the storm. Like one of the places recorded in Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27. And after he's calmed the storm, the disciples in the boat say to themselves, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the, the sea obey him? Well, the whole point is that was no mere man with them. Jesus was setting that up, trying to communicate, you're not dealing with no mere man. And so Matthew is writing these words uh, recounting what happened to people who knew Scripture. And so they would see that creation is responding to the blood of Jesus. Jesus the King, Jesus the God. And they tremble both at the horror and also the anticipation that promises of God are coming true. Now, Draw your attention to the, how the, the nations respond, the fifth response in our text. This comes from verse 54. You have the centurion. A centurion is a commander of a hundred. And so the centurion and those who were with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, the things that happened. They were terrified and said, truly this man was the son of God. Now a centurion, that means someone who rose the ranks of the, the, the Roman military. He's a man of war, a man of blood. And so he has his thousand soldiers that he's over, and they seem like they're on execution duty. And so Pilate held court, this, this morning court, uh, daily, possibly, what, five, six days, 
And so five, six days, they would march people to Golgotha, the place of the schools. And let's say theoretically, they averaged three death sentences a day. It's potential that that um, could have been a lot more. But if we just do that, that's 15 crucifixions a week. Take that times 52, it's 780 deaths that this centurion oversaw in a year. And that might be quite low. So 780. The centurion and his soldiers were probably quite callous, unfeeling at the sight of blood and death. And yet this blood, this death, was different. And unlike, unlike Pilate, who tried to get out from beneath the situation, tried to wash his hands, these Romans saw that this was the son, S-O-N, of God. Not simply Barabbas, a son of a father, but the Christ, the Son of God. And this is an anticipation of all nations coming to know Jesus as Son of God and Savior. That's when you open the book of Acts, we meet many nations coming to hear the good news. And one of those in the early chapters, chapter 10, is a centurion, a God-fearer, already kind of prepared, his heart's prepared, to, and, 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 and God sends Peter to him. And he quickly responds to Jesus' bloody work as good news, that the division, the separation, all Greek, Jew and, Greek, and, and, and Gentile can become one in Christ. Now, what a contrast between the previous three, Judas, Pilate, and the people. Right? In these two, there's trembling, there's anticipation of promise, and there's acknowledgement that truly God died for his purposes to set us free. In other words, there was worship in here. And so that moves us to our fifth point. So what do, what, so what do we think about the blood of Jesus? What is our response? I hope this survey was helpful to point out that it is normal for the world to be filled with people like Judas, Pilate, and the crowds. People who respond to Jesus, they like him, they like his benefits, they agree that he was innocent, they agree that he was good and wise, but they miss his very purposes and his blood. And so there are many that walk around crushed in guilt. There are many walking around that think that they're in charge and they can just blame other people for all the problems. Sound familiar? They think they can, they think they can walk around and they can have Jesus their way. These things describe the last hours of Jesus before he, was, he gave up his spirit to this very hour. So what is strange is those dark, the darkness of that day and the darkness to our day is actually seeing people respond correctly to the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. That's the strange part. That's what it's building up to. In addition to Jesus giving up his spirit, that's what it's building up to. And so, like the, the people would see what, 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 um, what Jesus shedding blood does for sin and guilt, that it dealt with it, it and, and, and that was the payment. And so we shouldn't be the same if, if such a penalty has been paid for us. And that also means we can be brought near, that, that temple curtains divide, is ripped. That means we can draw near to God the Father because of Jesus. And it really, no one is getting out from beneath the blood. All are guilty. All, all our sins are upon him. But for those that see it and confess, there is forgiveness in the blood for this work to happen. And that's why when we sin, even as Christians, we don't want to stay there. We want to confess it and receive that forgiveness and the power to, to walk away from that sin. We're also not walking around, hopefully, like we're the ones in charge. Instead, we want to be pointing to the one who is in charge. You see, every moment of these dark days uh, that, that we, were, we just observed, Jesus was in control. And that's the same true for our dark days. So we can walk around thankful that Jesus is not giving us what we want, but what we need in his plans and purposes. So overall, in this rare five-point sermon, it's just to impress upon us the strangeness of responding to Jesus correctly, rightly, that we would know him on his bloody terms and desire to keep knowing him. That this should grow a heart of thankfulness and humility in a world full of guilt, pride, and a world that tries to find answers in death. Right, there is power in the blood. 
to conclude and hopefully give you reflection, we saw five responses to Jesus. Three that were partially right, but at the end, they're just completely wrong. Uh, you know, any truth with a, with some, a half truth, with a half wrong, the, the half wrong overrides the truth. So they're ultimately wrong. But we see two right responses. And so how have you responded to Jesus? How is it helping you grow in thankfulness and humility? And then finally, how does your heart go out for those walking around in guilt, pride, and in the shadow of death? So I think uh, those are some questions to ponder on. Uh, when you look at ourselves, how are we growing in humility and thankfulness, and how then are we walking alongside those like Judas, like Pilate, like the crowds? Because that's actually a normal description of the world that surrounds us. So with that, let me pray. And uh, uh, blessing, Father, I do thank you for your word that we can read it and, and see as foreign as sometimes it seems that it really accurately describes the hearts of, of people today. It's the hearts of the people then and the hearts of people today before you, the, the same God uh, that was the same God of, of, of the past, of, of the present, and of the future forever. And so help us to ponder these things and to respond to them. Give us power to respond to them. We'll work by faith. And uh, may we behold more of Jesus because of it. And I thank you for this time. I, I praise you in the, pr the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in. Until next time, may Christ show up more in your days.